Hello. Hey, Justin. Justin's checking in. Okay, so where do I do that? Yes. Yes. Okay. There you go. Thanks. Right. Sounds good. Um, so I'll pass, take one, but you have to fill it out. You have to write it today. That, that, way, that way I know that you're going to do it. Okay. Um, just show it to me. Um, but I want it bef before you leave at noon today, you need to write a thank you. So who could you write a thank you to? Or not a thank you, even just any card. Who could you write? Okay. Okay. Yeah. It is. Um, have you talked to any for sale by owners recently? Um, have you talked to anybody about trying to be their realtor? Send them a written card here. Somebody. I don't care. Send one to Jessica. I don't care. Send one to Paula. I don't care. Send some. Send somebody. Um, so take a take one. I don't know. I just grabbed a handful. If I need to get more, I'll go up and grab some more. I get these every year when I go to the Keller Williams family reunion. I just buy a 50 pack while I'm at the convention or 50 or a hundred pack. I don't know what they come in and, uh, and have them so I, so I can, can, I need to be more better at writing these things. So I'm going to write one along with you today. Okay. Um, I need to do it, do it more. Um, the reason I don't write them is because my, Handwriting sucks. My assistant tells me that every day because <laughs> she has to um, come in and ask me what they what everything says when I write her notes. Um, and so, uh, but you need to get in the habit of, of writing writing uh, uh, cards and thank yous out. Um, who was your teacher on Friday? Was it Sherry? Oh, Michelle. Michelle, was it? Good deal. Good deal. Okay, let me get to the this page, the page where I'm supposed to be. Whoa. Where is this? Okay. Get that up a little bit here. Okay. Um so what page? Let's let's get Okay. I don't know if my text matches yours. Do you have it all pulled up on your computers or Okay, page nine talks about handwritten notes. Um, there's three different, if you don't know what to write, I think it's page nine of yours. It's in page nine of mine. I don't know. It says your turn, handwritten notes. You see it? So if you don't know what to write, there's some scripts for you. How good's Keller Williams here? Okay. Um, what's that? I spent my weekend doing notes. Did you really? Oh, so you don't want to do any more? No, I'm not You're going to do it? Okay. Yeah. Practice, practice, practice. It is. Until the pending drawer is completely full, keep writing them. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so there's some scripts for you to use. Um, okay, page 11 on it. Do you see that uh, funnel there? Uh, it says now is the time to work with sellers. Can you fit there? I don't know whose stuff this is that's here. What is this? I have no idea. My database or data bank. What is this, Jessica? Thirty days and then a calendar by the month. So every month she moves it all over into daily, and then that way she knows what her followers are. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Okay, let's look at that uh, little diagram there. It starts out, um, we're gonna be talking about pre-listing packets and listing presentation um, today. Uh, the pre-listing packet, I have to admit, I'm not the best on. I have one here, but I don't use it as well as I need to. Um, it's one of those things, uh, I think it's good to if you use it and have it up to date. I've just had a hard time keeping that portion of my presentation up to date. So 
I'll pass it around. It, but you can get this if you log into the Keller Williams the intranet and or the, not not our intranet into Keller Williams on there. You can do a search for under the documents and come up with ones that are I think they're PowerPoint and you can download them, put your stuff in them, put your information in it, and you have it. Okay. Brett, also, eEdge has a great pre-listing and listing inside of, um, called the guides. If you look, search for guides. Perfect. Okay, so you need to do that. Get the, so it, it, you don't have to develop it all yourself. You go, well, what do I put in to a, the pre-listing guide? Okay, um, we'll get into that here in just a little bit, some different things that go into it. Um, but the pre-listing one isn't my uh, forte. It's that is meant, I believe, for something to be delivered. Once you talk, once a, a, you, you have a lead that says, "I want to sell my house," and you say, "Well, I need, I want to come out and do a market analysis on your house." Uh, between when you talk to them on the phone and when you go out there you should be delivering your pre-listing packet, okay? Then the next one is the listing presentation, and that's what we're gonna spend most of our time on today. This is a sample of what mine looks like. Um, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so you take it from leads, and then you get, from leads you get appointments, and then it kinda goes down the funnel there, and then once you get into uh, from appointments, what's the goal after your appointment? to get a contract, okay? Um, uh, should you leave your price, I call it my pricing presentation, your listing presentation, Do you, should you just leave that there and say thanks for meeting with me and walk out the door? No, you're asking for a commitment, okay? You're asking for a, uh, an absolute commitment on it by signing a contract. Um, oh, Ignite teaches you the activities that are proven to generate results. It does. Literally, if, you'll, if you would do the pre-listing packet, get your own pricing presentation. Once you get in talking about buyers, if you get a buyer consult packet, if you'll get a buyer uh, packet, um, a contract to close packet, if you get all those things done, you're going to feel more confident in going in and meeting with your sellers. Okay? Um, let's, there's a video in here. How do I get to the video? Jessica? Oh, she left. Great. I'll, I'll see if I can find her. Hold on just a second. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Um, what are, don't know. She said they were pulled up. There she comes. Will it? Hey, Brett, on your, if you hover over the Chrome icon down at the bottom, <coughs> we should have, you should have the, um, the MyKW on that Chrome. Yes. When you click it. Okay. See them? When you click it, it should be on the page that has all the power sessions, and you go to power session four. Yep. And it says Asian skills. When you click that and then drag it to the left so you can put it up on the screen. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. Okay. And then double, yep, there you go. Hi, I'm Josh Doss from Vancouver, Canada. I'm with Keller Williams for eight years and been selling real estate for 18 years. Now I'm going to walk you through my listing presentation, and it's a three step process. First part is preparation, second part is presentation, and the third part is follow up. A lot of my listings come by way of referral and repeat. And so when the call comes in and they want me to come over and listen to me, I have a conversation about what their needs are. What exactly is it you're looking to do? Are you moving up? Are you moving down? I have them tell me exactly what the reasons are that they're selling for. I get a real sense of what direction that they want to go. 
One of the things that we've done to make my appointment setting a little easier is we time block. We follow what Gary says. He says time block everything that you do, and we time block our slots in advance for listing appointments. Every day, Monday, Friday, we have a slot available at four o'clock and a second slot available at five thirty. So I've got a potential of ten listing appointments Monday to Friday. That makes my life a lot easier because I'm able to time block my lead generation first thing in the morning and not have my day so loose and scattered so I'm trying to scramble where to put a list on it. What we do now in our, in our team is we, we've decided to go paperless with our evaluations, our CMAs. So instead of printing off paper, what we'll do is we'll take it on the computer and convert it to PDF, mark it up with a highlighter from there on the computer, and then create an email from that, email that package off to our client prior to going out to the home to list it. What I do when I, when I go on a listing presentation is I meet the sellers at the door, and I have them take me on a tour of the property. During that time, I'm actually asking them to tell me again, to recap again, what their motivation is for selling. So I'm getting them more comfortable them moving out of their house is what I'm doing. That usually take. Okay, I'm going to pause that real quick right there. He said he walks through the home when he, when he gets there on it, okay? That's what I do. Let me tell you a little bit different idea that, uh, well, he, I go through and walk through the home, but I normally have the sellers go with me so I can take notes and I want them to take or to tell me all the features of the house. Um, I, there's some agents that are doing this around the country that they're not, when they're going in there, they're telling the sellers potential sellers that they want to just go through the house themselves as if they were a buyer. Try it. Okay. I haven't, I have such a routine down about what, when I go into the house and I, I like to sit down first with them and take some notes on the house. I have a sheet that I've created myself that basically mimics our multiple listing to an extent. It has the grid like we have in ours. It actually, this was the exact layout of a system before Navica. We had, we had I've, I've been doing this for way too long, 23 years now. And we've had like four different systems. And this was one that was clear back probably almost 15 years ago, but Navica actually at least mimics it in this area. But I found that it just is nice for me to fill out. It doesn't follow Navica exactly, but I fill out that and then I take notes on it. So I'm sitting down with them when I first come in. After I've done the Ford with them, I usually sit down and it's tough. How many of you done the disc personality profile? Most of you have you, if you haven't, you should. So you know your own personality. Jessica can get that to you and you should do that. I'm a high, I'm a high D I and a high D and a high C, which means I'm pretty attentive to details on the, on with the C. Uh, everything's got to be correct and in place for me. And then D is a driver. Jessica te teaches an incredible class about this. She knows the disc forwards, backwards, and every other way. Okay. But you can sit down with them. And when you're doing the Ford, who, who knows what Ford is? Um, family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. Dreams or demands, one of the two different ones on it. So, yes, just go down that. So, you sit down with them and you're building a relationship with them. Okay. And in this, you're figuring out what kind of personality type they have. Do they want to just get to the details or do they want to sit there and tell you about their grandbabies and stuff? If they're going to tell you about their grandbabies, they're going to be an I probably, okay? That's what they're, and so you have to cater your presentation around that. If they're a high I, are they going to want to know all your 10 pages of stats and your 12 comparables that you've used in your market analysis? No, they're not. They're going to want to just have you tell them what it is. Okay. So occupation, family, occupation, recreation, and all you're doing is just 
breaking the ice with them, okay? And then I start into grab my sheet with my clipboard and I say, tell me a little bit about your house. How many bedrooms on the main floor do you have? And I get all the information. After I do that, then is when you're supposed to go look at it. But when he says go through the house, I like the concept of it. I'm just the C part of me. I want them to tell me the things that about the house that I may not be able to see. Like maybe they have in-floor heating in the master or something like that, that I may not be able to pick out that may add a little bit of value when, when I'm doing my market analysis. Um, but I think there's a lot of merit in going through and looking at it yourselves and going, okay, wallpaper, peeling off the walls in the bathroom because there's no uh, fan in there or something, you know, and you can take some notes about this so that when they do commit to you, once they've committed to you, then go back and go through it with a fine tooth comb. I've learned, this is getting a little ahead of myself, but a lot of people have worked really hard to get their house ready for you when you come and look at it. And they want you to stage the home as much as possible for sale right then. Should you stage the house for sale before you have a commitment from them? That's a service you provide to clients. Meaning no. Clients. You you are they a, a client contract. at this point? No, they aren't. They're not. Okay, and I have done this way too much. When you get burned by telling them everything they need to do down to, you know, taking a wet towel to wipe along the baseboards, you know, and stuff like that, cleaning the windows and doing things like that, and then they all of a sudden list with someone else, that's the last time that you'll do it. Okay, let's finish off with him. But think about that, whether it fits your personality style to have them go with you and tell you more about the house or to not and use the excuse that you're trying to view the house from the eyes of the potential buyer so that you could give them constructive feedback. I think if you use the excuse that you're looking at it from the buyer's perspective, they'll, they'll be a little more comfortable. Do you think they're gonna sit down out out in their living room and go I wonder what he's saying, thinking about our house yeah that's that's good actually okay make them think wonder what you're doing okay what's that you walk into a nightmare a nightmare house uh -huh. it, like smells as dark or well, one you put your paper yeah in. um uh then i would kind of skip that part of going through myself uh, and I did about six months ago, nine months ago, uh, I walked into one house where I, there was no place to even sit down. I like to sit down first and there was no place to sit down. It, everything was filled and cats running everywhere. And I tell you, me and cats do not get along. Um, when you've chased them throughout a neighborhood trying to catch them because they snuck out a door that, and then I'm highly allergic to them. So, you know, it's another reason I just don't like to have to do that. But literally there was no place to sit down. So I had to alter my presentation from the get go on it. And sh the staging was way out of the question at this point because it was, it was basically a hoarders type house. Um, and yeah, I was in and out of there in about a third of the time that I normally did. You get lost. No, I didn't. Did I did my market this? analysis for it, but that was one that they were like, well, we'll see you in, in six, well, maybe you're ready in six months. It was like, okay. Yeah, please don't call me back then. But um, anyway, okay, let's keep going here. Takes about five minutes. And when we're done there, we transition right over to the kitchen table. We'll talk about the market, the evaluation itself, and that in itself is about 15 minutes. Once we've agreed upon a price that we're gonna list at, we'll sign a listing contract. They sign the initial three-page contract, they sign the property disclosure statement, and they sign the working with a realtor brochure. Outside of those three documents, that's it. I send in my measuring company to come in and measure the home. I send in my stager who's gonna contact them to come in and stage the home. 
And once she's done, then I send in the photographer and I take the photos of them. We always do a follow up with them as well, just to say, how did that go? What was that experience like for you? It keeps them feeling like they're in control and very much a part of the process. And it lets them know that we're paying attention to every detail on their listing prior to it even being on the market. One of the expectations that I set with the sellers is that I phone them twice a week on purpose. So I set their expectation for me to phone them on Monday mornings with what's called a Monday morning update, where I review everything that's happened for their home over the over past weekend with them. The second call that I set them up for to expect is on Fridays, and that's a Friday morning market update. And what I've set them up for is that I'm going to talk to them about any new listings that have hit the market, any expires that have come up from off the market, and any solds that have actually just happened since that past week. They also know that on Friday, we're going to be talking about the numbers. Does the current list price that we're at right now still make sense in relation to the latest listings or the most current solds? They know in advance that that conversation could lead to a price reduction. And a lot of times, they bring that on themselves. They say, hey, look, you know what? It looks like we might be a bit high, Josh. Should we bring it down? So it's a natural transition to a price reduction. One of the reasons I choose not to do a pre-listing package is when I'm sitting in front of them, I really want their full focus and attention. I want their attention on me, and I want to be able to ask them questions where they're giving me their full attention and not flipping through a pre-listing package. Most of their questions are going to come straight from their God, and that's really what I'm looking for. I'm Josh Bath, and I just shared my listing presentation with you, and I wish you all the best with yours. Okay, there's another video in here, but we're going to talk a little bit. Um, I, a couple notes that I took up there. Photographer. Do you take your own pictures? I always have. 23 years I have. I just went to breakfast last week with a, with a guy locally here that, that will go in and take pictures. Um, it's around, depends on how big the house is, how many rooms they're doing and stuff like that. But he was real reasonable. I think he was around 150 bucks to do it. Now I know starting out, 150 bucks can be a, can be a lot of money. But if you don't know what you're doing, and he could put together the whole pictures of that to showcase your first listing, it's something that you may want to consider. Okay. And if you want to, just give me contact. I'll send you his contact information too. His name's Spencer. Okay. I haven't used him, but I'm going to use him. Uh, I have a wide angle lens that I fit on my iPhone. You have to, who's taking pictures of a listing yet? Okay. Is it as easy as you thought it was when you were just looking at pictures? No. Can you, do you, how many walls, you know, does it do you any good if you're standing in the doorway of a bedroom and you're just taking pictures of two walls? No, it doesn't. Do you need to get a window in there and three walls and try to get the closet in there? There's no way to do that if you don't have a wide angle lens, okay? These photographers have all these things. They can do drone, you know, pictures. They can they use a gimbal so they can use a video to enter into the house. Trust me, they have the stuff. They're set up for it. You're not trained necessarily to take pictures. Let them do it. Let the professionals do it. You be the professional realtor. Let them be the professional photographer. And it may set your listings up to look a lot better um, uh, as you're getting started and getting your reputation. Because remember, when you plant your sign out in front of that yard, your reputation's on the line. Okay? Um, you don't want that sign to gather rust in the ground, do you? Before you put a sold sign up and take it down. Okay? All right. I learned a, a quote, and I'm going to show you. I wrote nuggets up here. Because I want you to take some notes today, if nothing else, before we're done here, I'm going to have go by each person, and I'm going to ask you to share with me a couple of the nuggets. Because I don't expect you to remember everything, okay? But I do expect that you're going to have a couple of nuggets that you can share with me that you can actually do. I want you to start two or three of them that you're gonna actually put into play before the end of the year and do these things, okay? Quote I learned probably 20 years ago is that list 
to last. If you want to, how many buyer's agents do we have in here that are solely buyer's agents? One, okay, two, okay, this probably doesn't fit for you as much then, but as long as you're in real estate, you could be turned from a buyer's agent to a full-blown agent, so that's something to know. So yes, this doesn't maybe fit exactly for you in your role as a buyer's agent, but for the regular realtors in here, this is how you survive if you want to make it. Have you heard what the dropout rates are, unfortunately, in this industry? What's that? In yeah, the first two years, yes, there's quite the turnover. We've seen a lot of this, you know, um, and I want you all to succeed. I, I don't mind the competition. It's all, it's all good. It raises everybody's game, okay? Um, but if you want to last in this industry, you need to list homes. Listings not only get you 50% of your income, it's what it's supposed to be, 50% of your income, but if you have listings, it also brings in buyers. It attracts your sign. You should be able to get buyers from your signs. You should get sign calls. You turn, there's quite a few times back in the recession time, 10, 11, 12, 13, where I didn't end up selling that house because it was a short sale, you know, or something like that. But I was able to get a buyer and they didn't end up buying that house, but I was able to turn them into a buyer on another property. So um, that's your goal is to get, get buyers, other clients from, from your, from your listings. Okay. But you've got to list to last. If you want to last, you have to list. Okay. There's just, so remember that. Okay. Uh, listings provide more exposures. I'm on page 12. Uh, uh, it's interesting. Uh, so how do you advertise homes now? Okay. Social media. Guess what? Seven years, eight years ago, that social media was not even an avenue that we even considered. You know, the Home Seekers magazine, there used to be one in that was called the Home Team magazine um, uh, that we use. One of the two we picked usually to advertise. That was the biggest stress for us was the deadline day to turn in our ads that was going to be for the next month's printed ab printed publication on it. Okay. Um, so yes, social media. How on social media? I shared like those groups. Uh huh. Okay. On your business page. Okay. Excellent. Um, I can't remember. I think did I share it when uh, Sherry was teaching or something like that last week? Maybe I didn't. Um, I had my first experience of selling a house from so from Facebook here just this last month. Um, these were excellent past clients of mine. This was the third house that I had sold for them. Best, uh, just wonderful clients. And their houses were always just in perfect shape, perfect everything when I, every all three of them that I sold, okay? This last one, I literally put it out on my own personal page. Cindy Schwick um, over at Silver Creek saw it, and it was, I did it as a coming soon. I know there's controversy about that right now, but I've been doing it a lot lately, and it obviously worked on this one because I just, put some, about six or eight pictures out there on my own Facebook. I didn't even get it onto the Idle Falls for sales and stuff like that. Just on my own, is it coming soon? She saw it and as soon as we had it on, we were getting ready to put it on market. She wanted to see it actually before that, which technically not supposed to do, but we're, I, we let them in there. We had a full price, $300,000 cash offer on it. And the sellers were building their next house and the buyers were accommodating to not move out until after their new house was built. So, or done. So it was a little, it was 45 days or so for closing. Dang. But how much money did I realistically have in that? Nothing. Not much. Yeah. Not much. Your gas money to go out there. <laughs> but I can tell you because these were some of my best clients. <clears throat> They didn't squabble a bit at writing me a check for 
$9,000 and right in the other agent who was there. It was her parents that she was selling the house to um, that they, they had no qualms. Now there's, I've been in, I've done short sales back in 2012. My worst story I have for a short sale is one over here by Longfellow Elementary. I worked it for two years. I had five transact, one, two, three, four, and finally the fifth one closed. So these first four failed. It was an $80,000 house. It took me two years to get to the closing from start to finish on it. All the fifth one cash offer finally closed and I got a $80,000, $2,400 check after two years, okay? So you have those, but then you have the ones like 300,000 that you just make money like that, okay? Um, uh, so yes, take advantage, learn what you need to do. Social media is, you have to do it out there, but you've gotta be careful not to overdo it or else you're gonna start losing your friends like crazy, so learn how much is enough to post and stuff like that, okay? And how much is too much, okay? Um, how about doing, paying for posting, boosting your posts out there on Facebook? I actually found, yeah. like, um, that worked really good, but I would, like, tag, like, some of my family in it and have them share it. Uh -huh. And I got a lot more, like, organic views. Did you? Uh-huh. But, I mean, I only paid for, like, the $5 limit and it was boosting, so. Yeah, I usually do twenty dollar one. Yeah. Um, and then you can go in and pick your demographics of who you want. You want people over a hundred thousand dollar income or whatever. You can go in and pick people in Ammon, whatever it is that you want, and that's who it goes to. So it kind of. So that's the way to do it. So yes, I would recommend boosting. I what I've done is I look at it and go, ah, I'm probably not going to get anything from it, but I'm looking at it going. I'm not spending two hundred and something dollars on, um, don't you go sit down before you give me a hug, girlfriend. <laughs> hey, oh, oh, it's a hug time. <laughs> this, this is my girl, this is my girl. Thank you. Um, we go back a way. So, all right. Um, listings are time levers. On average, you can close two to three seller listings for every one buyer listing, okay? Uh, Let's watch the second video that they have here real quick and then we're going to, I'll get in and show you a little bit more of my stuff. Hi, my name is Gene Rivers, and I'm here today to tell you how to develop your listing skills to a very high level. And after you've done that, you've got to go in and take over market share. Number one, the best source for listing leads is from your sphere of past client list. The fact is, the people you know, know that people are going to be moving. Whether it's at church, school, work, friends, relatives, focus on making sure they understand you're in the listing business create a pre-listing package that you would give every seller, but rename it your guide to selling homes successfully in your market. And then give that to people in your database that you know have influence, that collateral material that they can give to their friends and refer to you. Step two, focus on an area, product, or price range. When you develop mastery of a product or an area, you will much more quickly succeed in those areas. And in that area or in that product or price range, focus on the FISBOs in that area, the expires in that area, your knock in that area, geographic farm in that area, and I'm talking a fairly tight area, so that the people in that area will really, really identify with you as someone who can help them sell property for top dollar with low hassle in a short amount of time. Now we're at number three, everyone today that's looking at hiring an agent whether it's a referral, even a past client, or a, a, a stranger who's gotten their name somehow, they're going to check you out on the web. So you need to make sure that your website is 
is confident that you've got basic, powerful content in there. And specifically, that on the landing page, the very opening page, there is a direct offering to a seller. Find out what your home is worth, get a guide to selling your home. But if you don't do that, you're going to miss opportunities because people will get your name, check your website out, and go, oh, I don't think so. I've seen a lot better sites. Fix your website with a database that you are working on a consistent basis and with a tight focus to you build your reputation if you're visible you will find you will take over more and more listings and in a very short amount of time 12 to 24 months you will own that market that's how you take market share okay all right let me get back to uh that down there. Hey, there it is, right there. Okay. Um, is that okay? Um, okay. Pre-qualify the seller. Let's look at this. Page twelve, thirteen. Page thirteen in your. Um, Okay, pre-qualify the sellers to understand motivation. How do you do that? Um, you just get them talking about why they're interested in selling. Uh, what is driving them to be someplace else or be out of where they're at? And ask questions, have a conversation. Um, times past, I you know, like with the Zill lead or something, um, I end up with someone on the phone, it's like, you know what, I'm just following up. Tell me about your situation. And that just opens the floodgate. And then you can poke and prod and say, oh, well, that's interesting to say that. Well, what about this, why that? And you can find out their why. You can find out what pain or hope is driving them one way or the other. Correct. Very good. And listen, you ask the question and you listen. Sometimes that's hard for us because we're somewhat in the driver's seat where a lot of us are more in the D type personalities and it's better to, or it's sometimes easier to sit down and say, well, this is what I'm going to do for you. And you just start talking. And I know I do that too much, but if you ask the questions, you're going to find out what you need to do and a lot about, about motivation. Now, is that motivation stuff that you, you need to take into consideration when you're pricing the thing? But it's also that you need to keep their motivation to yourself, right? Okay. Um, uh, I had a client or a, an agent over the weekend uh, that was giving away their client's position. I was taking advantage of it because they were, you know, <laughs> I just keep talking. Just keep talking, girl. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, when they were hesitant to come back to us with a counter offer, like, Oh, I know we shouldn't be doing this, but my buyer wants to do that. Well, so they were hesitant about doing that. So what were we doing? We just played strong on our, like, yeah, that's the best we're going to do, you know? So anyway, uh, but keep pre-qualify the seller, um, use the pre-listing package. Okay. I have in my office, I, I have red folders for sellers. I have blue, so blue buyers, it's just the way I've done things. But I know if I'm looking for a file in my office and I know it's a, it's a pricing presentation that I'm more a CMA that I'm working on. I'm looking for a red folder. It's a, just a little folder like this until they become a listing and then they get a nicer red folder that has the clips on it and stuff that I can keep all their documents organized in. But until then I just have these ready to grab and go. Um, uh, I have, um, a questionnaire, it's called seller interview form that's in here. That's basically getting all their information, their contact information. What time, when's the best time to reach you? Uh, how soon do you plan on placing your home on the market? I like to ask that question right up front because I need to educate them because some think that they're, they've got the house completely ready that when you're showing up that you're going to be basically planning a sign. Well, Jim Windmill does that, okay? He does a one-step listing. I don't. I do a two-step listing. So I'm previewing the house, and then I'm going to come back and present my market analysis, 
and be ready to list it then. So that's the two step, okay? He goes, having done already some research, even though he hasn't seen the home, he shows up there with somewhat of some comparables and is able to come up with the price right then and list it. So I educate my people when I ask by asking them that question, how soon do you plan on getting your house on the market? I got to set some expectations. I got to find out if they're ready to go right then. I got to step my market analysis up, do that because I found that I, I want to do a market analysis up front, even though if they're ready to do get it on the market, I'm going to explain why I think doing a market analysis and taking a little bit of time to do it is going to be good. And I'm going to, if they're ready to list and they're basically committing to me, I'll spend some time telling them some things that they need to do to the house to fill the time between then and when I come back to present my market analysis. There's usually, other than this $300,000 house, that in fact, they, they did need to do a little bit of work in there to stage their house, you know, to get it ready. Um, they had too many boxes and stuff like that around there and they had to do some stuff. But I had to, you got to find out their motivation and then set their expectations right up front as to what, what your timing is. Because some agents only take a day or two to do their market analysis. Um, I, I have an accounting degree and I have a master's in business. My, and so I love crunching numbers and I do it probably too much. But I usually spend between four and eight hours on every market analysis. And I tell them that right up front. I said, this is something that I, I take very seriously in pricing your home. If this is probably your most expensive asset that you own, I want to make sure that we price it on the market right. And I can tell you, when I end up pricing them right, they end up selling faster. Okay? Uh, so uh, I set the expectations right up front that it's going to probably take me three or four days to do a market analysis. And is that fine with you? Okay? I just get their approval on it. So I ask him, what improvements have you made to the home since you've owned the home? I've already done the research. When they call me and say, come list the home, there's two things that I do instantaneously once I hang up the phone. One is call the title company or email the title company and get a property profile coming. Okay. The second thing is I pull up in Navica. You go into Navica and you just do an address search. You don't put active, you don't do anything. You just put in the address and keep it as simple as possible possible 1268 twelfths, just one two just put numbers in there okay or if it's um uh stone gate just write stone because you don't know if someone's doing stone and leaving a space and doing a gate some everybody sometimes they can do it different so just put an address in there and pull it up and print out all the times that it's sold before you can see if their square footages have changed you can see what it's sold for in Navica has a history back to pretty well 2000. Before that, we went through three different systems. I think it was 2000, 2001 that we switched. Yeah, 2000, yeah, 2002 maybe that we switched to go over to Navica. So you've got all the history of listings pretty well in Navica of what it's done. You can do a tax search in there. Get the information all that you can on it when you're going to before you're going to meet with them the more information because I open up that property profile when I sit down with them and I can tell them oh, it looks like your taxes are sixteen hundred dollars oh you know that oh yeah I do I do okay um, uh, yes please Asking too much about what? Oh, about like they're asking too much for the house. Oh, they price wise? Yeah, that's where it's going to come down to your how critical it is for you to get your CMA correct. So if you can nail it, what? Um, I can tell you, there's two extremes of realtors. There's some that walk in 
with basically a, a one or two comparables and they basically say, what do you think your house is worth, Mr. or Mrs. Seller? And they're gonna shoot it high. And if you haven't done your research and you go, well, it sounds like close enough, let's try that. You're probably gonna be way too high. But I can tell you, when I come in on the second meeting and I flop this down on their table, okay, this is a little bit intimidating, okay? Granted, it is, but it's meant to be that way to an extent, is that I'm establishing myself. A lot of this stuff is boilerplate that I just filled in. Yes, my CMA is in here, in there, but by the time that I'm done going through it, I think I've pretty well established myself in, as the professional, because I'm the last page, it says in summary or in conclusion on here, um, it has, uh, let me see it here. In conclusion, right there, that I'm telling them, this is what I think it's gonna sell for on the bottom, and if you wanna be on the market between one and 90 days, this is where you go. I usually go, let me just draw it for you up here on the board. This is what I think it's gonna sell for, and if you wanna be on one to 90 days, I would recommend going two to 4% higher than what this number is right here, and that's the price that I'm going to recommend. If you want to sell in one to less than one to 90 days, if you don't mind being on the market for 180 days, that's six months. I can tell you the honeymoon period ends about 60 days. Okay. Then all of a sudden they start blaming you for everything. If it doesn't sell in that first in this time frame right here, but you give them the option. <laughs> Say if you want to go 90 to 180 days, then what I recommend is you can raise it between four and 6%. I pick a middle number and go 5% generally. And that's what you'd, you'd want to price it at if you want to be on 180 days. Now, oh, then I start going up here and I go, sure. Let's say this was, I think it's going to sell for 150. So this is 154, five or something. I'm just using numbers and this would be a 160. Oh, sure, you could go 170 up here, but wow. Do you want to be on the market 365 days? Who wants to be on the market for a year? Nobody. And what I say, I can get this for you if you're, if you price it in this one, I'm pretty confident that we can get that, that price. But if you start here, what's going to happen is an opposite effect. Instead of this scenario, you're over here. And oh, I write WCS. Who knows what WCS is? I said, you don't want to go to WCS. What is it? Worst case scenario. <laughs> they don't figure that out. But you don't want to end up in the worst case scenario here. And that generally is 140. So it's going to penalize you if you start too high. The buyer's going to slap you and tell you that your house is not worth 150 anymore, that it's worth less than that. So why don't you just start here? And if we can get a buyer, this is where we're gonna end up. Is this better than the WCS? And I tell you, when I do this scenario to them, I don't end up at the 170s. But if you come in and say, what do you think your house is worth? And you go, let's, let's try that, let's, let's, let's do that. You're gonna, is it not natural, the human tendency that we all think are properties are worth more than what they really are. Yeah, it is. So you think a seller's going to lowball you? No, they're going to put, put it up there. Okay. All right. He is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but we're, we'll circle back around. Um, so questionnaire, let's get back to that. We're asking all the questions and then that's when I start filling out my sheet. Tell me a little bit about your house. How many bedrooms on the main floor do we have here? How many of this? How many, what improvements have you done since you've owned it? Because I know when they purchased it generally, unless they haven't sold it, and bought it in the last 15, 17 years, then I'm not going to have any information if that's the scenario on it. Then I'm taking copious notes, but the county, the property profile should give you a lot of the counties around here will give you square footage to at least start on. 
from that. Uh, so, um, but fill out as much information about the house, and then that's when I say, can I take a tour of your house? Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try to tell them I'm looking at it from the buyer's eyes. Try it. See, see what you like. See if you like. But I generally have said in the past, let's give me a tour of your house, you know, and I take, take notes. And I have notes here, and then I turn it over if I need to keep taking notes on it, okay? Um, oh, oh, I have a sheet in my pricing presentation that I go through that I, and I tell them this sometimes before, after I'm done previewing the house, I'm telling them, okay, I'm going to go back to my office. I'm going to tell them what I'm doing now. I'm going to go back to my office and I'm going to pull up, do comparables and, and do a market analysis for you. Okay. And I tell them that it doesn't happen just in 10 minutes. So that I take between four and eight hours to do each one. And I say, you know, finding four to eight hours in my days is a little bit tough. That's why it generally takes me three or four days to do the analysis. Okay. Um, but it's kind of like going to a doctor. If you're having some tests done, you're probably not going to find out the results in instantaneous, right? Again, anytime you can compare yourself to another professional, I think it's better. It's going to help justify it. It helps justify my scenario. Am I trying to bring that down? Yes, because sometimes I have got phone calls because I am too long. I can tell you, I have really learned that you do not leave that first appointment without another appointment to follow up. Because if you don't have a follow-up appointment, you're going to take a lot longer to do your CMA, especially if you're beginning and you don't know how to do it and you don't know what to do. You don't have your presentation and stuff like that. You don't have a bound up presentation or something like this to do. You're going to take a little bit longer. And then all of a sudden you're going to get a call that says, Sean Anderson just listed the house. Okay. So set the expectations, have a, an appointment. It's another one of my things that's in my packet ready to go is my next appointment letter right there. Okay. And do you meet with them the next time at your office or their house? The office, so let's, let's do it. Show my hands. <laughs> Who says you should meet, meet them at the office? Raise your hands. Depends. Okay. At your, at their house, raise your hands. Okay. There's no right or wrong answer here. Okay. Which where you're comfortable, but I, I do mine. And in my letter, that I have on it, I have checkbox. When I'm filling it out and putting my day and time for the appointment, is I'm saying it says Brett's office or your home. And I cater it for each each client. If they have real young kids, it's going to be hard for them to come to my office. Okay. Now, I it's not a given that I'm going to go to their house if they have young kids. I have. If I can emphasize that the next time that we're getting together to meet is going to be the most important meeting between now and closing, I've had sellers say, we'll get a babysitter. We'd like to meet you at your office. Bingo. It's a script. Use it. Okay. Um, because yes, the office is the best place, but I, sometimes I have to paint a picture about how important that next meeting is. And that it's going to take, I set the expectation, it's going to take 45 minutes at the quickest and most likely, depending on how involved we get in, if we sign listing documents and go through all the listing documents, then it could take upwards of an hour and a half. Okay? But am I setting that expectation? And when I leave that with them, the last line of my letter says, if it is your intention to list your home with bread at this time, please bring two keys to this appointment. Okay. Tell you, if they're making keys for their house and have them there on your table, can you make some assumptions that they're ready to list with you? Do you cater your presentation a little bit different? Absolutely. When they, you see keys on that table, <laughs> yeah, oh, maybe. Okay. It's your, it's your listing. Okay. So you better have brought listing documents ready to go. Okay. Um, so you leave 
Oh, they have some sample. They have a questions on here, page fourteen, I believe, on your in your book. So if you don't know what questions to ask them, <laughs> Ignite just gave you them. Okay. How did you hear about me? Where are you moving? Um, that's a perfect opportunity. That if they say they're moving out of the area, the next question that you should be asking is, "Have you started working with a realtor there yet?" And if you haven't, then let me refer you to one. That should be, this should be the precursor to the main question. I, I wish they'd have written another question right out there because that's a bonus for you. I had some sellers here about two years ago. I was selling their um, $450,000 house here. And they were moving down to New Mexico and I referred them to an agent down there. The only house that they could buy that was close to what they had here was a $750,000 home down there. And I think my referral check on it was like $4,000 for making a phone call. What's that per hour cost? Should, <laughs> yes. Should you ask the question, do they need the help of a realtor? Yes. Get in the practice of doing that. Okay. And if you don't know, talk to your, talk to the broker and find out some ways to how you can find out you call their team leader down there where they're moving to and you say this is the personality types who would you recommend in your office to work with do you try to accommodate if they say well we want you to help us look how do you work that well i don't i you can make that decision i don't I listed my mom's house down in Pocatello once and it was just an, it was just not a good experience because I don't know the realtors. They have two different multiple listing services. They use ours and they have their other one that I just was like, I can't do you a service down there. So uh, if you say I don't feel comfortable and I don't know neighborhoods and stuff like that down in Pocatello. So I'd like to refer you to someone down there and you just, have someone you work with down there call up yeah, Jessica will know who you can who you can work with personality wise um, stuff like that okay uh, Twin Falls areas I'll put a little plug in because I'm gonna be president of the multiple list or the multiple listing the our association this next year so I've been involved ever since I think it was my second or third year in the business Mike Hicks grabbed me and said, let's go to the state convention. We went up to Whitefish, Montana. That's God's country up there. You know, man, okay. And I went to my first state realtor convention. I've missed one since. Okay. I think they're really good, but I've been involved on in our state association. I was the, our East district vice president, represented all the realtors up and down the, from Salmon to Milad. So I spent a lot of time in Boise and doing that. And I had skipped the position of doing this, our, Real, local association so that's why I'm doing that but I can tell you by doing that position and going to these state conventions I've got to know realtors from all over the state so I know Lewiston you're going you're gonna work with Tom Torgerson in Coeur d'Alene you're in Boise Gail Hartnett she's awesome it, it, there's just different people I have that I have great referral sources with um, throughout the throughout the state and throughout the country I'm Next week, next week I'm going to the National Realtor Convention. I'm, I'm a convention junkie, I guess, if you will. I go to Keller Williams. I've missed one of their conventions. I had missed in 15 years that I was with Remax. I missed one convention with them too. So I, I believe in them. I go purely for nuggets every year. Who taught me this list to last? He just passed away a couple years ago. He was a great guy, but I just loved his stuff. Howard Britton was his name. So anyway, let's get back to this. The questionnaire is there. Use it. Get your referrals. How much do you, oh, see, and, but I cater this. Number 10, how much do you want to list your home for? I, that's not a question I ask. It's personal. If you feel comfortable in asking for it, but I think that sets, again, they're giving you their high number, right? So when you start to do your market analysis, are you going to cater around their high, high number? And maybe you shouldn't have catered around their high number. So I don't like to ask for price. In fact, if, any, if there's any discussion 
that comes up on the first one, I'm going to tell them, I would prefer that we don't discuss price. When I come back the next time, it's going to be mostly about pricing. Okay. I just don't want them to, I just don't want the discussion to be much about price. Um, where they get to discuss price is when I'm getting ready to walk out the door. I'm leaving them with, yeah, it's a little plan words. Seller's homework, right? Okay. But I leave this packet with them. And I have to educate them because I have people that show up at my office the next morning at eight o'clock and hand me their homework like they're turning it into their teacher. Okay. And I don't want that. I don't want to see this because the third page talks about what price do you think your house is worth? What would you like to ask? And then what you realistically think it's going to work for. So I go through this with the sellers and say, I want you to fill this out and I'll get this from you when I come back or when we get together the next time, preferably at my office. Okay, bring this with you. And this is a reason that I call them the day before or the day of our appointment, depending on when the, what time the appointment is. And I, I say, don't forget your homework, bring your homework or have it ready when I'm coming. Okay. Uh, Cause I like to call up and confirm. There's nothing more frustrating that I take my time out and do my whole market analysis, and then I show up at the house and they go, oh, we forgot you were coming, and it's just not good, okay? So I like to call them and set them up and remind them that I'm coming out to meet with them, and please have your homework done, okay? I'm gonna pass this around, I'll pass this whole packet around. I would encourage you to put together a packet like this so that when someone does call you up and say, um, Come talk to me about selling my house. You grab it and you go. You start putting your property profiles in there. You put your MLS printouts and you're ready to go. You've done the research and you're ready to go. So pass that around. Correct. Yes. So on that, if um, agents need to find out if they want to start with something, if they go into eEdge, there is in the My Marketing section in the, um, in the designs, Okay. If they go in and find, they have a pre-listing and a listing packet. So it's a great way to combine that those ideas that you're saying and go in and take some time to customize. So if they do get that call, they can grab a packet. It's got all the stuff you know you like to have every single time, and they can customize a few things and go right from there. So that's right in eEdge um, under, the, under the marketing pieces. Perfect. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so check out the E-Edge, and then I don't mind if you take some ideas from these. Do I want you to copy them necessarily? And so, um, no, I, I would prefer that you don't. But if you, want to, if you want to have a copy of it, to take it and develop it yourself, I don't mind it, okay? I just don't want to show up and be in competition with someday and see this exact same packet sitting out there, okay? <laughs> um, and I do the same thing with this with this packet too. If you want to, if you think a couple of these slides or whatnot, pages in here that you like or whatnot, feel free. We're, we're, I don't know, is that the belief system up here? <laughs> okay, we share. What's my kicks doing? He's sharing. In fact, if you're, Jessica, can you unmute? Um, tomorrow, I think you got the email that they're doing mega agents yep. camp or not. Um, I don't think it's been announced, but I know my kicks is down there. So whether he's going to be on stage or not, I bet he is. So I would suggest as much as you can tomorrow to be here. It's here, Jessica, right? Yep. I appreciate you plugging that. It'll be all day. It's 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. They can come down to the training room and watch. Also, you can just go in and connect on live through KW Connect. If you go to the education tab, KW Connect, you'll see the live with Gary Keller, and you click on it and watch it. It is going to be amazing. But it's great to watch it in the room, you know, get on the big screen with, and bring your computer and work and listen at the same time. Yeah, they had to cancel Mega Agent this year because of the hurricanes down in, in Texas, and they all went down and did Mega Relief, so they went down. Everybody that had signed up, they didn't hold the agent camp. They went down to and helped down there. Uh, Chalmers and Ro Ross went from our, I think, from our office still. Um, but... Uh, this is going to be basically what it was going to be down there and you get it for free, right? It's free, right? Jessica. Yep. It is just live stream all day. 
Okay. And there's no home tours tomorrow. Isn't there? Okay. <coughs> so canceled, that's that's good. So that, that's that's where you should be. If geez, I'll have it on in my office. I know that. So. Um, okay. It'll also it'll be live stream in both Idaho Falls and Pocatello in okay. the training rooms. Okay. Um, question number eleven that's on there. It says, "How much do you owe on the property?" Ah. Okay. When you're going and trading off a car, do you sometimes want to give what you owe on it? Have you ever had that problem that they use that against you at the car sales place? Okay, so sometimes people don't want to share what they owe on it. Um, so be a little careful with that. I usually don't ask that question until they've committed and we're going through our listing agreement. Then I say, it's either then that I ask them how much, they're, how much they owe on their property, or when I have gone through my market analysis, I have a formula. I'm gonna write formula on here because I wanna hit it before. So if I don't hit that formula before we're done, but it's in my market, in my, it's in my pricing presentation here, that I have a formula that I find out what their, I tell them what their net is gonna be in, in the end. If they listed it at my price, or here or here, or whatever price they want to list it at, I give them the formula to what they're going to net on it, and that's when I find out what they're, what they're, uh, what how much they owe. So be careful. Now that was a question that we had to ask back when it was the recession, because quite often they would. That was a question you needed to know going into it before you did your market analysis as to what they owed because sometimes they owed 250 and they their house was realistically only worth 220 so you knew it was going to be a short sale and you had to price, you had to go into it knowing that okay because you had to cater your market analysis around it okay i'll be sending you a packet of information uh you know if this is questions that you're asking on the phone before you go over there that's fine if you're going to literally be sending over your pricing or your pre-listing package pre-listing present package or whatever i sent i gave passed around okay if you're not then take that out um this is important number 14 will all decision makers be there um sometimes i've got in it or i've had just like a wife that's shown me around and, and then I'm meeting with them uh, to do my pricing presentation. And I can tell you, oh, my son, or my husband got caught at work. Well, I'd almost rather reschedule because I want all decisions makers there, not for my previewing appointment, but especially for my, the pricing presentation appointment. Um, uh, Cause I hate having, I mean, it's an hour of my time. And if I have to go through it again with the, the other spouse, it doesn't help. And if you're dealing with like an estate situation, you need to find out who the decision maker is. Is there, is there an, a trustee or somebody that's been appointed to, to handle the affairs? Because otherwise you don't want to be dealing with people that you don't have to be dealing with. Okay. Okay. Uh, set the expectations. The last one, just so you know, our meeting will take between 20 and 45 minutes. Okay. Um, the next meeting uh, is where we're going to discuss the marketing and the pricing of your home. I say we're going to go through, I kind of set the expectations um, of what the next meeting is going to be. Um, we're going to go through a whole bunch of marketing statistics. What's the difference between market analysis and an appraisal? Um, we'll go through the statistics. We're going to go through the, the market analysis on your house. Um, we're going to go through and discuss my uh, uh, six C's of selling real estate. Steve, you've heard these before, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you remember what the six C's are? I don't. Okay. We'll hit that here in a minute. Um, but I tell, I just bait them with this. We're, I'm going to review my six C's formula for, uh, for selling your house. And I tell you, their wheels start going. You can see them over there. Uh, what what those C's are, okay? And I like to just leave it with them. So there's just some encouragement out there to um, uh, 
for me to come back, okay? Um, uh, if they're searching for, if I realize that it's gonna be a little bit more difficult of a market analysis to do, it's not like a Cloverdale 1040 that I can do in an hour, even though I'm gonna tell them it's gonna take me four to six hours or four to eight hours to do it. Um, I can do a Cloverdale 1040, a three bedroom, one bath, 1040 square foot. How I can do those CMAs in, in, in an hour, you know, on it. Um, uh, that we, I tell them, oh, Jeffrey shows up in the back. Nice. Um, uh, that I tell them uh, that we're gonna, I'm gonna do the market analysis and, uh, and then come back and, and meet with them and, and we're gonna go through, so we're going through the different things. I'm gonna tell them sometimes one of the C's. If I'm, tell, if I'm trying to encourage them to do a few things before, between now, if they need to declutter, clutter is one of my C's. So I'll, I'll tell them that, hey, between now and then, you may want to work on getting your house ready to sell. And clutter is, is one of them, okay? One of the C's. And so I'll share that one, just one C with them, but I won't share the rest of them until I am going through my presentation on it, okay? Um, okay, pre-listing packet, it has that in there. Uh, I gave you the one that I used. Skip ahead to page 18. These are some things that are in the pricing thing. I, I tell you, I have seen this pyramid diagram on it, and I have never been comfortable in using it. Because I can tell you, if they price at market value or if they go 10% below, I, I don't recommend the sellers to pricing themselves 10% below um, in, in today's market. Um, and they're saying that how many buyers are gonna look at it if you price it 10% low, I just think these percentages are off. They may work for a national basis, but I don't think they work for ours here. Because I think if, if you price it 10% low, you're leaving money on, on the table that the sellers could potentially be using. So I haven't felt comfortable. I've never, I've seen this diagram for 20 years and I've just never been comfortable in including it in mine. Um, uh, get ready to sell, condition. Can you bet that's another one of my C's? condition okay um, has questions for you so a lot of the things that I talked about um, are in there right there um, uh, okay let me go through a little bit of what's in my uh, my pricing presentation uh, on it when I first sit down I explain the difference between an appraisal and a market analysis. What is the difference between an appraisal and a market analysis? Um, as far as my understanding goes, the market analysis will tell you what the market will give so that they have an idea of what they can expect once they put their house on the market. Whereas an appraisal is for the lender's benefit. And it's they have that done in order to ensure that if the sellers leave the country and stop making payments, that they can get sufficient money out of the house in order to cover their investment, in order to cover the mortgage. Correct. Okay, so is a market, or is an appraisal required in order to get a house on the market? No, it's between the buyer and that eventually, okay? Um, uh, uh, so I explain that an appraisal uses three comparables. Uh, in my market analysis, I can use up to 12. That's how many Navica allows me to use in their software. Uh, you can use other softwares to do your market analysis. I've grown comfortable with doing them in Navica. Um, do y'all know where to do that in Navica? Have you? Yeah. Navica training. Oh, it is. Is it this week? Tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? <coughs> okay. Some Starts tomorrow. I think it's all week, isn't it? Different, different things. I think we had to move it up because we're leaving town, right? Okay, yeah. So I think um, they are doing it. Okay. Um, 
but yes, learn how to do a market analysis in Navica. Um, uh, and if we have time, maybe I can show you a little bit about how I do mine. It's 11 o'clock. We've got about an hour left. Do we need to take a break? You want to? Yes? Brad? Yeah. Yes? If you take a break, you've got to be done in one hour. Okay. At 10 minutes to 12. So if you take a break, make it a short one. Okay. Let's take a five-minute break. Five minutes. Don't get caught looking for <laughs> looking out there. You're going to do it. Let's just take a quick one. Yes, we'll do first. I do. But I explain in my, when I'm going through them, I actually do up to 12. I do two analysis for them. Active and pending is one analysis. And the next one is closed. So I break them up. I don't like to mix it together myself. Um, I so I do two separate ones. <laughs> I just want to keep my yeah. film with you. I, 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 yes, everybody's doing it. Does it different. You can use yeah. if you can find the best three to five. But I've had sellers say, well, "What about this one around the corner?" Well, for sure. If you use twelve, you're going to have higher more of a chance to get the one around the corner. But quite often. It's one that's in a way higher price range, and maybe it was a two-story. So I can say, oh, I didn't, I didn't use that one because your house is a one-story, and it's a two-story, and I'd rather use this. So yeah, that would be great. I, I have a lot of I did, When I explain this to the appraiser, as I say, um, with the appraiser wants to use homes <laughs> that are really close to you, <laughs> and they'll use different style of homes so. to get close to yours, because that's their guideline. Well, we're actually doing the title call. Is open. Yeah. I can open it up. I can yes. use, like if you're doing Rockwell homes on the east side, why yeah, don't you so limit it to just once in Hillcrest area versus Bonneville so, High School? Yeah. <laughs> Put one story in there so you're getting a style of home, but then doing, you do a, pulling homes for both Bonneville and Hillcrest yeah. outside the area. So yeah. I'm doing two separate that's what I'm finding out. It's on it. And that's because an appraiser. What you want to see is only closed properties, right? Yeah, so not doing things he does not use so. the current competition. Um, and I tell the sellers that you can't compete with the ones that are out there right now. Um, I you're never going to be able to close. So, I mean, I'm, my focus is just as far as I can, but I am. I mean, I have one. I have one. Yes. Four hours. I'm like, right now, but I'm just hoping I can. Yeah. Yeah. It is, but what happens <laughs> when I'm the four to six hours, there's, I have a system that I come back and I do the search for the oh, yeah. similar home. Let's say it's between 215 and 325 that I'm using this home for. So I'm doing my search and I pull all the comparables that I have there. It then goes back to my assistant. She then takes those comparables and puts them into the CMA form into the there so she's doing the initial number crunching i've gone in and told the software already adjust twenty five hundred dollars like i just got after last year adjust thirty five hundred for every different bathroom she can do this she puts in the comparables so when i say four hours it's not being four hours or three six hours it's the assistant doing a lot of the work for me okay putting it in and getting everything. Then once she's done the initial so setup on it and done some initial right. number crunching, she hands it back. Well, thanks. You and then I go in and do the adjustments, the technical adjustments. And then I hand it back to her. She prints them out, binds up, and puts the presentation together. We scan it before we do it, so we have a record of it. And then we bind it up. And, uh, so between, it goes back and forth between me and her. And you, you on every one you list. It's my OCD. Yes, but yes, I do. Because when I do the active and pending, that tells me what we should list the house for. When I do the closed properties, it tells me what your house is most likely going to sell for. That's my script. And why I use the two different ones, because if I'm using closed sales to come up with a, they're wanting to know list price. 
Yes, they want to know what it's going to sell for, but in my opinion, you got to come up with both. So the only way you're going to get what it should list for is comparing against the ones that haven't sold or the pending ones that are right now. So that's why I do just that analysis. But I tell them, I want we're, if we're going to choose a group to focus in on, which one are we going to want to focus in on? The closed ones. Because those are the ones that if we stuck a for sale sign out in their house today and we sold them tomorrow, the closed ones are the ones that the appraisers going to use as comparables. They're not going to use the ones that are for sale. So we need to focus on those and then we can raise the price <clears throat> 2 to 4%. Quite often that's because depending on the price range, 200,000 and under, what percentage chance are you going to, that a buyer's going to ask you to pay sellers close, or sellers, buyer's going to ask you to pay the seller to pay closing costs, their closing costs? It's about an 80% chance. Under $200,000, that's what's going to happen. I know some agents that that's just part of what they put in the offer, just to nibble and see if, to sell what we It is. And I'm going to warn you because I had this done to me over the weekend. And this is on a $500,000 house listing of mine. They sent me over an offer. Look, I'm just going to tell you a little bit of the scenario. It was asking four eighty seven dollars on it. Okay. They sent me an offer for four seventy. dollars It's been on the market about 30 days, 30, 45 days. They sent me for four seventy. dollars So I sent them over. I just texted them back and I said, do you have any comparables for me to justify the 470? She was a little bit newer agent. Okay. She goes, well, it's not a 470 offer. It's a 480 because they had offered 480 with $9,000, $9,600 of closing costs. So I'm going to tell you, don't fall into this trap and try to convince an experienced agent that it was a 480 if that's what it says on the first page if you're given the gut shot on the fourth page that says that you're asking the seller to pay closing costs don't try to convince another realtor that you're offering 480 because it's not i need your lunch because i said it's it's not it's not a 480 offer it's a 470 offer that you gave us okay and that's 96 percent and what the stats show that you're going to probably sell between 98, 99%. Look at Mike's stats. Okay. That's what it's probably going to be. That's where we ended up with last night. Sunday night, we ended up at four, 485 with $7,000 of closing costs. So we ended up at 478. Something like that. Yes. In that same vein, I uh -huh. mean, I do know some buyer's agents who are wise about that, and you'll get a, an over, uh, no, 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 no. Upper, well above and over to no. account for no, no, no. Watch food yes, food. and that is that, more acceptable in your mind because that's more of a realistic take. Yeah, I don't tell me what the net sales price is. Yeah, just because it says 480 on the front page doesn't mean it's a 480 offer, right? right. Just don't, don't try to convince someone you will lose. You will lose if you try to do that, okay? And because I'm not, I wasn't born yesterday, okay? <laughs> and, uh, Most people would rather have an actual bottom line than some clouds, pride in the sky idea. It is. They'd rather just fail, say, X, Y, and Z, this is it, how much is going to come out. It is. I'm going to get to you. Just hold your thought, okay? Um, but you need to convince your sellers, and I had to do this last night, um, I, because my seller, which I like to sit across the, my desk. I do not give them the offer. I don't send it to them by email the night before we meet because they're not going to sleep that night. They're going to sit there and stew about this. And I got an email because I sent it to him. I tried to send it as late as possible on Saturday night because I got it at like 9 o'clock. I sent it to him at 10 o'clock. They wanted an answer by 6 p.m. on Sunday. I work Sundays. I had to yesterday, okay, just to, to, to help get this one along because they wanted a quick answer. So it'll. I woke up six o'clock on Sunday morning, and I have a response from my seller. And it, I, this is exactly why I don't send it to him. I like to. He's in Lewiston now, 
I couldn't meet across the desk with him. But I then I kicked myself in the butt for sending it to him earlier than when I was going to do it because he stewed about it all night. He'd come up with this whole long list. These buyers don't even qualify. They only put $2,000 earnest money down and they're only putting 10% down and stuff like this. They'd come up on a whole th things. And I have, a, I, ha I, I was able to squelch all his problems within five minutes, but he lost a whole night's sleep on it. But yes, I had to convince the seller first thing that it doesn't matter whether they, wrote an offer for 480 and asked for $10,000 of closing costs or if they just wrote on the first page 470. I said, let's not get hooked up on how much there is above the line that they're asking. They could have put $500,000 on there and asked us to pay $30,000. Crap, I heard cars were being included in houses down in California in the recession. They literally were including Mercedes Benzes that were sitting in there. So they were inflating the prices way up and then having all this stuff included in it. And I told my seller, I said, don't, don't get, it doesn't matter. Commissions are based off of the net sales price. Just worry about what the net sales price is. Does that make sense? Okay. Why, I don't, I don't get the problem. Okay. A woman, an agent called you and said, okay. they, they said they made an offer for 40. They made it, it said 480 on the first page, but on the fourth page, it has seller agrees to pay up to $9,600. I'm going to use $10,000 of closing costs of the buyers. So was it really a $480,000 offer? If they're asking us to pay $10,000 of their closing costs? No. Well, she tried to convince me that they had really written the offer for 480. <laughs> and it's not a 480 offer to my seller. Well, um, no, she she didn't respond after that. She understood she she wanted to try to convince me, but there was no there was no convincing. It was 470. That's what I'm telling my seller that it's a 470 offer. There was no Because you're experienced and knew the reality. I know the reality, and I'm warning you. Just if if you put a 480 on a purchase price, but you ask the closing for closing costs, don't try to convince the other realtor how good your offer is if it's three percent lower on the fourth page because of what you're asking the seller to pay. Okay, so I'm a little bit direct with that, and I I don't have a lot of patience with with Okay, I, it appeared to me as stupidity because really it's 470 is what they were asking, what they were giving us the offer for, right? No. Yeah. So we okay. should be really nervous. We ever have to present. No, see, and I, this is where I come across as a big growly bear, but I want to, I, I try to be a teddy bear as much as possible. But yes, don't, don't cross me with, with, with something that is, um, I, I want, I, and I negotiate deals. I just got, we just got one put together, um, uh, on a deal that was, uh, 200, 200,000. I just got put together and we had to all melt together and we got it put together this morning. So, um, uh, I can be a teddy bear, but no, I, I can be a growly bear too. Cause I know the scripts. You're not going to push something past me if it, if it shouldn't be. Ask me. Okay. Mickey Mouse, yeah. Ah. Okay, back here is the question. Well, and I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I'm just trying to understand. I know, I understand what you're saying is as this seller, $10,000 in closing costs. So, net, it was four seventy. dollars Correct. But, no. I just, I just don't understand how that's offensive. Please. How you be buyer's agent. Approached you with that to not get you upset. I just, I, well, I don't yeah, um, they should have told me that it was a 470 offer. It was that it was okay. four, it was 480 with ten thousand dollars of concessions, so that it was a 470. That's that would have got me. That would I would have had no problem with that. Okay, but when when you try to convince me that it's a 480 offer up front, when there's a ten thousand dollar gut shot, so should they have yeah. said? Or should we, in the future, in a similar situation, should we say we're offering 480 with $10,000 in concessions? 
That's is that how we should just say? I would. I would. Even though it's in the paperwork. It's in the paperwork, but that, don't don't try to. to I, I would. I would. Okay. If you try to, say it's a 480 offer straight up. With the take with when you if you're asking for concessions in there, then you're you're. It's it's not gonna. No, it's not true. Okay. Tell them what it is. Um, and, and I just, if I do that, um, if I'm on the buyer's side, I just, I don't focus on the that, the concessions or something like that. I just don't try to hold my position that I am giving them a 480. So I don't try to disguise so your, it. Your issue was not that it was a 470 offer. It was, she said, she was trying to convince you that it was a $480,000 offer. Yes. And they were going to get $480,000. Yes. yes. Shell game. It was. It was. It, it, it wasn't a 480 offer. It was a 470. So if she'd be straight, we wouldn't have had any problem on that. So it, 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 was, it was the way she did it. I convinced me that it was a literal 480. But when I'm doing my net sheet for the seller and you included $10,000 extra in there, that's that's not a 480 offer. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. No, I just kind of learned it's important, like when working with buyers, like. So you're going like you're asking the seller to pay like cost like this. Yes, booty. That you're only offering four seventy because these are your closing costs and not the seller's responsibility. Correct. Is it a good thing to do to have sellers pay buyers closing costs? Yes, quite often. Especially that's why it doesn't under two hundred under two hundred thousand. Especially is it because okay. This is not part of the, the lesson, so I'm, I'm deviating a little bit, but for every, let's assume they have the money for their down payment and closing costs. If they buyer can keep $5,000 in their pocket and use it for improvements, and they raise their loan by $5,000, how much more does that cost them? Five, baby, just give me five. It's $5 per thousand. Remember that. Whoops. Five dollars per thousand. So if they are asking for five thousand dollars, they've raised their loan amount essentially by five thousand dollars. In a sense, that's what it's done is raise their loan amount by five thousand dollars. But they get to keep five thousand dollars in their pocket. How long does it take for them to make up that five thousand dollars? About thirteen years. Okay. Brett, are you off screen somewhere? I am. I'm standing off on the side. You want me to oh, get there? Oh, there you are. Sorry. That's okay. Did you hear me still, or was I can still hear you? I just couldn't okay. see you. That Sorry. Way. Yeah, I was just wandering a little bit. Um, you get until the corner, of the, a third of the way through that screen on your left. Okay, and then that's when it hits me in the eye, so I had to go further. Okay, gotcha. Um, so five dollars per thousand. So it's going to cost them an extra thirty dollars per month on their payment, but they've kept five thousand dollars in their pocket. To use, so in my opinion, if it takes 13 years, how often or how long are people going to be in houses? Generally, less than seven or 10 years. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So keep the keep the 5,000 in your pocket and raise it up. Raise it up. It's it's, it's cheap money. It's you're only paying three percent. If you're going to save it and put it in a CD, you're not going to earn that much, are you? Okay. So it's it's smart. To do, I can convince a, a a seller that it's a good thing to do. Again, I get the focus for the seller that it's not off of. It's the bottom line what everything's based off of. Don't worry about. If they ask for ten twenty. If they ask for your Mercedes Benz to be included, if they've given you a hundred thousand extra, include the Mercedes Benz. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> okay. All right. Any more questions before I keep going here? How about we share the six C's of selling real estate? That's my little soapbox that I tell them that I get up and preach on. Okay, six C's of selling real estate. Cost. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to repeat these back to me, okay? Cost, because I have memorized. What's the cost? That's the market analysis, right? That's what I'm coming up with. So I say we're going to eliminate that as soon as we get to the market analysis here in just a minute. Is someone needs to mute out there? I think it is it Amanda or somebody. 
someone needs to, may need to mute themselves out there where we can hear some of that. Anyway, um, there we go. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, so cost, that's what, that's what we're gonna come up with on the market analysis is the, is the cost, okay? So I just kind of skip past that one. Cost, color. You think color is important in selling a house? Okay. Okay, color, condition. What's some others? Declutter. Clutter's one, clutter's the next one. Cost, color, cost, color, condition, clutter. And then the last two? Curb appeal. Curb appeal and computer appeal. It used to be five C's back before the internet came up. Because we used to have MLS books where you had one picture in there and that's all you got. Now we have the internet that has 300 pictures that you can put out there. And all of a sudden, computer appeal is very important. Okay? So I went from five C's to six C's. That's how long I've been doing this. Okay? Because computer appeal wasn't important when I first started. Okay? Cost, color, condition, clutter. Cost, color, condition, clutter. Curb appeal and computer appeal. So I preach on these. In fact, I have at the back of my presentation... I have a sheet that I just rip out of the uh, out of this, and I'll go through and, and start taking notes once they've committed. Okay, so that's how important this six C's are selling real estate to me. Okay. Um, What's about the color? Color. Um, what if you walk in to a bathroom and it has? Uh, okay, in a kitchen, it has avocado green appliances. Or it has um, pink bedrooms. All the bedrooms are pink on the paint. Okay, so, and is color of is pink carpet or the old green, forest green carpets good? So color is, is okay. and it's more, I'm thinking more on walls. Um, you know, and I tell that I joke with people that there used to be a color at the paint store called Realtor Beige. Okay, because that's what every house we wanted was was just you want nice neutral plain neutral earth tones. That's what I tell them. Okay, um, it, and I've had to change that a little bit. It used to be earth tones, but what's been most popular in the last five years? Grays. Okay, um, so I've had to change that a little bit, but I tell you. HGTV changed our industry when they had that the shows out there that all of a sudden they were putting red walls out there and popping things that changed us it changed things so we you know color is different now than what it was back then it used to be realtor beige everything had to be white and then everything went to where they wanted three tones mostly earth tones but white ceilings color on the walls and then white baseboards, that's what we wanted is three tones, I think. And then it went to this wood. And then all of a sudden now it's more in back into the white craftsman style type everything, right? So um, uh, so color, that's the color I'm referring to is, is, is that. Um, uh, oh. I just know that I've seen houses that were, uh, the exteriors were white and had no other character film, they were gone like nobody's business and then the most people other houses just sat there forever because they were dark they were gray it's yeah they look like the haunted house of the new brother yeah. <laughs> yeah um uh what can you get into in uh 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 in curb appeal do you have them work on landscaping if it's way overgrown yeah sometimes they have to do some work there Okay, um, sometimes putting shutters on changes a you know white house to popping it. Okay, so it just and if you don't feel comfortable in going in and telling them what they need to do, there's professional stagers that are out there. They'll pay for it. You tell them that they have to pay for them. Holly Cook does it. Evan Cook, the realtor here. I think they're still around here. So if you need somebody. Holly's great. 
Um, okay, so uh, that's the six C's of selling real estate. Um, uh, let me see where I've got that. Um, I tell them we have a mutual objective to sell your house at the highest possible price in the shortest amount of time with the most favorable terms and with the least inconvenience to you. That's kind of a four things that I go through. I'm going to pass this around. I talk about factors affecting our market. And I came up with this one. This is not something you're going to find in any of the ones that are out there. I came up with these and I changed, have changed it, but I've found new construction affects our market. How much new construction is going on out there? If there's, we usually, back in like 2005, six, seven, you know, before the crash, they were building so much out there and prices were going up and it re allowed the regular sellers homes to go up because you know, let's say there was an existing home that had five bedrooms, three baths, but they were going out and having to pay back then 150,000 for new construction. It, for three bedroom, two bath, it allowed the five bedroom, three bath homes to be able to go up to it. So it depends on where new construction is. So that's why I have it in here. Residential sales, I say, we're gonna discuss some statistics here in just a minute because that's the next set of stuff that's in my book here is the statistics. Um, interest rates, what about interest rates? Do you think interest rates affect our market? Okay, what happens when interest rates go up? What happens to buyers buying power? Um, I understand that for every 1% an interest rate goes up, that reduces the buying power of buyers by 10%, approximately. Uh, yeah, it's, a clo it's close to that 10% uh, on it. Our Mike Hicks did it, shared something with us that it was around a $200,000 house, that if it went up one, it was, I think he said, it to have the same purchase price on it with the higher interest rate, to have the same payment on it, it was about 178 was their new max. If it went up another percent, it went down to 155,000. So that's a little, that's a picture that I use to people that says your buying power really goes down. Is there a difference between 150 and a $200,000 house? Yeah. So, but we've been using this kind of analogy that interest rates were going to be going up and they haven't for, and so you got to be careful if you are quoting um, what interest rates are going to do, what just quote what the talk is in the news out there. What is the talk that's happening right now? Did they go up last week? Yes. The interest rates went up a little bit last week. Okay. And are they, is the fed set to meet in December? Yes. And what's the talk that they're going to be doing? raising it. Okay. So you can use that. If you're quoting other people, um, then you're, you can get away with it. Okay. So interest rates affects buyers, uh, uh or the market. Uh, then I have on here mortgage crisis. You think we've had a mortgage crisis in the last 10 years? Yeah, that's caused, that's what caused us to get into the whole debacle that we that caused us from 2008 to, to do this for five years straight, then it plateaued out. Then 14, it started raising again. Okay, started raising, went to here. Now we're up to here, okay? So, okay, does the INL affect our market? Yeah, I can tell you, when they had 200, 200 layoffs out at the site, do you think it affected our market? Yeah, when there's all of a sudden an extra 100, 100 homes on the market, you bet you it affects our market. Is, does the U.S. economy affect our market? Yeah, it does. Does the time of year affect our market? Can you have sellers price at the absolute primo top end? They may have got away with this in June of this year, but are they getting away with it in November this year? No, they're not. So I have time of year on there. Then I have farmers on there sometimes if their crop prices are completely in the tanks, not to say that farmers and their employees are what drives our market here, but I tell you, when they're in the crapper, their employees aren't coming to buying houses. It affects our whole economy here locally, I think. So that's a smaller part. That's the smallest sliver on my pie chart that I have in there. 
The biggest one that I have is the mortgage crisis because I can tell you that really affected us big time from 2008 on. Um, uh, the next thing I've developed, I, ha I keep my own market statistics. And so I have graphs that I show um, the sellers, the potential sellers, to try to paint a picture. I tell them, especially when I've gone through and figured out what their personality type, if I've got an engineer style type, I'm gonna go through these stats because that's what they're looking for, okay? So I, I've already determined what kind of personality profile they are, and I'm gonna, depending on it, is I'm gonna cater the, how much, how deep I go into statistics. But do I know them? Yes. Okay. Um, oh, I don't have current stats. I didn't bring those down with me here. Um, but uh, Mike's, if you come to the office meeting that first, first Thursday, second Thursday, is it second Thursday? Um, of every month, Mike shares his statistics with you and he explains them in a very good way that's realistic to do it. So I would highly encourage you to attend the monthly meeting. Um, you don't get in Gary Keller's top 100 by not knowing your stats. Okay. So you need to know some that you can quote people, what's the, what percentage is the market up this year? Okay, you need to know that. Do we have more listings on the market right now than what we had last year at this time? No, we don't, okay, we're lower, by how much? Well, I think seven, seven out of the nine months, no, it's I think seven out of nine months we've had less sales, no, it's, I think, we just printed out new ones, so I'm confused with which ones I had from the month before to this one. But we've had, we've been up some months, we've been down some months as far as closed sales goes, but inventory has been lower every month this year compared to the same month from the year before. Okay, so you just gotta have some statistics. And you know, it's, it's interesting, because I get printouts of Mike's stats, and I snip it, if you use the program that all the things, ha all the computers have that's just, snag it or something like that. I don't know what it's called, but I just take his stats and I copy it over onto my own document and, and put my headers on it that says for the month. And I use his statistics and mine. Yes. Yeah. How do they improve the infrastructure? There's so much going on. There's no way of knowing all of the things that are coming on the market. It's just like, it's like every month there's this whole new chunk of new houses. I was just looking at this yeah. going, that's that's How Rockwell. Okay, that's How Rockwell. Not all of them make it to the multiple listing on, on Rockwell. And so Mike and his statistics have what they are and you can see how how they're doing and it's interesting that 300 to 400,000 dollar homes in new construction have been almost non-existent say in 2015 we sold like 3 of them and then I can't remember the numbers don't hold me to these but then we went to like six this year. We've already got like 16 of them sold this year. So it's dramatic as to how many more new construction in that higher price range are actually happening. But that's because all the builders got their butts kicked in the recession and took most of them out and they're just barely getting their feet back underneath them to be able to go out there and do those ones again. Okay. So just knowing those, and then you can see by a, my stats, it just, I get them from the office staff and they post them out on the intranet. You can get in, you just go into the market center intranet and you go into documents and it has my stats in there and you, you take them and use them as if they're yours. But it's interesting that I asked the front desk, I'm the only one in the market center that asks for them. So I, I have my own and Maybe they're using them and they, you, they're not bothering the front desk staff about because they usually put them out there with all of Mike's stuff on them and I have to snag it, pull it off and use my own, use it, okay? Um, so I request it from them in a different way so it doesn't have all the stuff on it and then I can take it and snag it a lot easier. So I'm reviewing with the sellers 
statistics. And again, what I'm trying to do is simply establish myself as a professional and I know with the market, right? And I'm telling them, they're, I'm painting a picture. I can't paint worth crap. Can you see my handwriting? Okay. But I am painting a picture with all the things that I'm doing, talking about the difference between an appraisal and a, and a market analysis, the six C's of selling real estate, what factors are affecting our market, the market statistics, where are we at, up or down? And then once I am done with that, I get into the CMA, the comparable market analysis that I've done from Navica. This prints out from Navica. You all can do this, okay? Do so you do the market analysis? Um, I include some pages in there that are from the pro from the property profile from the county because I go in and I say, okay, your house is assessed at $228,000. It's usually higher or lower than what mine has, has come in at, okay? So I, if it's a lot lower than what I think the market analysis, I say, will you sell it? Uh, will you sell it for that? Oh, no, 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 we wouldn't sell it for that. And I was like, well, good, because that's the lower assessed value is what it means your, your taxes are lower, okay? And that's good. There's a difference between assessed value and market value, right? Okay. Um, so I go through that. Um, uh, I get into absorption rate just a little bit, but this tends to be one of those topics that kind of goes over the seller's head if you're not careful with it because most agents don't understand what absorption rate is. And what it is is that it's the number of homes that are being absorbed into the market every month. So what I do is I figure out what the absorption rate is for their price range, their bracket that I've used. Let's say that my gut says that it's probably a $270,000 house. So I'm using 250 to 300 is in my parameters. So I go in and I do a search in Bonneville County. I don't put high schools in. I don't put bedrooms. I don't put bathrooms in. I just say Bonneville County, how many homes have sold between 250 and $300,000? in the past 12 months. And it tells me that there's been 80 homes that have sold in the last 12 months. You take that divide by 12 and it tells me how many homes that are selling per month, right? And then I go out there and do a search between 250 and 300 in Bonneville County. And it tells me that there's 20 houses that are out there. You divide that by how many you're selling per month and it tells you how many months of inventory you have. Did you follow me? Okay. What's a balanced market? What has our National Association of Realtors told us that a balanced market is? How many months of inventory is it? Five to seven, about six months, give or take a little bit. I use four to six, but yes, so five to seven. But I have a little scale right on my page there that has, that if it's one or two or three, it's a seller's market. If it's and I usually do four to five. I put brackets around that, that it's a balanced market. And then after that, six to eight, it's a, it's a uh, buyer's market after that. So I'm trying to show them what it is in their price range, okay? In their specific price range, okay? Um, and then I get into my market analysis. I, I mentioned this, I'll restate it as I was saying. I do two market analysis for each one of my sellers. Um, I think did most of you hear that discussion? Okay. And the reason I do it is because I'm using active and pending properties. That tells me what we should list the property for. I'm using closed properties to tell us what it will sell for. Active and pendings tell me what we should list their house at. Closed tell me what tells me what their house is going to sell for. So what I do is I take the average, if you print out the CMA, if you've crunched all the numbers and it takes a little bit of experience or you have to come and ask different people, I, that's what I did. When I started doing market analysis, I went around and said, Mike Hicks, how much do you adjust for four bedrooms versus five bedrooms? Every agent's gonna be different the way that they do it. I've just found I've got comfortable with my numbers after doing them for enough years. 
that I had just $2,500 for a bedroom for every difference in bedroom. I had just $3,500 for a difference in a full bathroom. I had just $5,000 for a difference in a two car to a three car. I, I just have my numbers that I am comfortable with in using it. But I, if you use the Navica CMA and you punch in all the differences between the subject property and the comparable, it prints out a sheet that tells you that has, it looks just like this and it has right down here, average adjusted price. So what it's doing is it's taking what prices they're at, active and pending since what their list price is, and it's netting out all my numbers from my analysis, and in the end it's telling them what the average adjusted price tells them what they should list for. Okay, and when I do the next analysis and it's based off of closed comparables, make sure you add in the seller concessions because those are important numbers in there too, right? Those $8,000 to $10,000 number that I was using because that can affect your pricing on it. You need to know how many of their competition had to pay or were asked to pay closing costs by buyers. Somebody wants an eight hundred eight thousand dollar home. They need to net one hundred and seventy. So you've got to list it for one ninety. Can but was does one ninety put you in this <laughs> price range right here? Because see, that's what we were doing back when in the recession days. That they would tell us that they owed two thirty on it, and we'd have to do a reverse calculation. That okay, if we sold it for two fifty, are they going to be able to get out for two thirty that they owe on it? And we had to do that, okay? I told you I was gonna give you my formula, right? Let's do that real quick, okay? Um, can I erase this other part over here? Too late. Brett, can you write in black? Do you have a good black marker? I do have a black marker. Let's use that instead. Is that easier to see? Yeah. Okay. So what I do is I, I finish my market analysis and I come out with what price I think it's gonna sell for. And what I do is I draw a little box and I put SP for sales price. And I say, we can use this number, we can use this number, we could use this number, we could use this number. It doesn't matter what number we put in there. I'm gonna simply give you a formula, okay? So for this example, let's just use this, 150. That for the sales price. Okay, then I say, times that by 0 0.925. And they go, what's that? How'd you come up with 92.5? What is it? Um, selling like some strong is that commissions market? and closing costs? Ah, bingo, right there. 92.5. So I say, if you're going to hire me, if you hire me, you're going to pay me 3% to sell your house. When they hire you. Oh yeah, there you go. Perfect, <laughs> Jessica. So when you hire me, you're gonna pay me 3%. I would recommend that you pay the other realtor 3% also. Because if you wanna discount the commission on it, you're gonna affect their, them and they may not be interested in selling your house. So yes, there's your 6% right there, okay? And then you've got a normal seller closing costs. About one and a half percent. Add that up at seven and a half percent. Take that off of a hundred percent. So what is that? 150 times 9.925. 150 times 0 0.925 is 138,750. So if we were to sell it for 150, you would Net 138,750. Then take, oh, how much do you owe on this? How much do you owe on the place? How much what? 125. 125. You're going to minus 125. You're going to walk away with 13,750. Check, net, in the end, ready to do what you need to do for your next house. 
Now, this is down and dirty. Do you, are, should you be doing a net sheet for them when you get an offer on their house? Yes. And I tell them, right there, the last page in my presentation here, I'm gonna start passing this around so you can, you can just take a look at it. If you wanna copy a couple of them, I don't care. Um, but um, I say I'm gonna do a real net sheet for you every time we get an offer on your house, okay? Because that the net sheet is what you, you gotta do. You don't use percentages when you're getting close to that. I see some confused looks on your faces here. Okay. Seven and a half percent over the price. I'm taking it off of the, the sales price. But it's so seven and a half fraction of the decimal is nine. Zero point nine two five. That's seven and a half percent off of a hundred percent. Okay. That's not counting if they end up paying five plus plus. Exactly. I'm, so when I'm telling them this number, I'm using hard number. This is the this is the four seventy, folks. Okay. And you said I'm sorry about one and a half. One and a half is just normal seller paid closing costs. What do you have? What the normal sellers have to pay? Regardless, just in every transaction I've closed in 23 years, the seller's always paid for title insurance. They pay for half the closing fee, right? The title company closing fee. If it's an FHA, they sometimes have to pay for the tax service fee, but that's a hundred bucks. And then there's the property tax proration credits that you have to throw in there. And boy, I tell you, depending on the time of year, it can be a little bit higher because like if they close on a property December 15th, it hasn't paid the taxes for the whole year. Are you following me here? Because in December 20th, the first half of the year is due. So if we haven't closed before, if we're closing December 15th, they have to pay 11 and a half months of taxes to give to a credit to the buyer. They're going to get a Kick back from their escrow account three weeks after closing. So you got to that, that number sometimes can be a little bit higher. This one and a half can be off depending on the time of year. Or if you're playing with a property that doesn't have a homeowner's exemption on it, man, you better boost this up to 2% or something, maybe. Again, I'm just trying to give them a down and dirty what they're going to net. I'll say, well, God, if you want to throw the numbers in there for 154.5, you've got the formula to run it through. And it, sure, everybody wants more, but they've seen the picture that this is most likely what they're going to sell for when I'm done with it. And I have to, I do my best to not come across as overconfident or cocky about that price, but I tell you, I've done the research. I don't lose too many listings once I get into it gone through my presentation with them, okay? Because um, I've established myself as a professional, that I kind of know what I'm doing. Am I, have I missed them? You betcha. I've had other realtors list the pro a property that I had done a market analysis on, put it for $20,000 higher and in this market, and they sell. Yeah, so I missed the target a little bit on it, okay? But I don't do it very often. I tend to be fairly close with it, okay? Um, when you're Brett, can I ask you a question? Please. What's the script you use when a seller says, but I think I want to try it at a higher price? Um, well, why don't we just try it at a higher price? Okay. Um, I'd be glad to, to, to do this. Just know that it's, I have a little teeter totter thing that I start using that the higher you go, the longer it's going to most likely take. Everybody wants this teeter totter. They want to ask top dollar, but they want it to sell fast. And does a teeter totter work too well if it's like this, or if it's like this? It doesn't. So you, you they go in line. We sure you want this, and I want the most for you. But I realistic, there is none. You show me the comparable and I'll grab the book and say, because I have printouts of all the comparables in there. I say, you show me the comparable that shows me that we're going to be able to get this 170. I'll be glad to, but I, am I beyond 
doing this? No, I've done it, especially in this time, type of market that you have to be a little more cognizant of it, um, especially if they've got a primo you know, style house because um, those are commanding extra dollars right now and they can sometimes get them. So sometimes I have to step my way. But if they do darken this door, I, have a, I like to build into my listing agreements right into the additional terms a price reduction. Put it right in the contract. You don't have to call them and say, well, what do you think about lure and your price? And they just had two showings of the place. Are they going to be too motivated to lower the price at that point? No. But if you have it in your listing contract that if there's no off, written offers within two, two weeks that you lower it to X price and if it's no offers by 60 days that it automatically lowers to this, what's going to stop you from doing that? You don't have to get their approval. You don't have to call up and make that phone call and say, I think we need to reduce the price. Because they're, they're open to it when you're listing. Because if it, you're trying their price, but if it hasn't sold, to avoid the WCS, you need to be lowering the price every so often to get to this point here so it's going to sell. Yeah. Do you have like a certain intervals? Is it every two weeks? Is it two weeks, a month, two months, six months? Or It's a moving target in today's market, in my opinion. Uh, I've listened to Chalmers do this class and watched him do this presentation and it's changed. I used to be 60, 60 days on the market before I used to hit them up for a price reduction. Even if they had listed here and we hadn't got an offer, 60 days, I'm usually was there to lower the price. Now, if you're not doing it two weeks to four weeks on the market, you're, you're missing it. You really have got to stay on that. So yes, it's so moved. the stats week to week, and if you feel like a price adjustment is warranted, I guess write it into the contract based on what the current is and just be in conversation with your sellers. Correct. And I, I, would, I would try to get it to this price if they started here within 60 days. Because after 60 days, your honeymoon period's over. And they start blaming you why the house hasn't sold. Bill, what do you got to share with us? My aha. Is yep. that what you're saying? Let's do it. Start going through that. 11.42, we've got eight minutes or so to go through some ahas here. Uh, I, if there's came, anything from Nuggets. Mine came from the video where the guy says that your potential clients are going to check you out before they mm -hmm. hold. And if you're not, if you're not in the professional mode on the computer, then so that's my aha. That's good. Sure everything is Excellent. Okay, start on the back, go here. Oh, uh, so I, I like them to have a price of the new controller. Uh -huh. So to separate a buyer from seller. Um, oh, and the tax. Make sure you have those all ready. Ready to go. Perfect. Okay, next. Remind me of your name. My name's Paul. I'm Lynn. Lynn. Okay. Tell me your name when you first get going so I can start to get to know names. I'm horrible with that. I liked the, what was your name? <laughs> my name's Harley. Harley. I liked the board to help them like, talk, speak to them about that. It is. If you, if you sit down and you, that's in the back of your mind, you don't need to tell them. <laughs> you know, obviously, you don't tell them, but you, hey, how's the family? How's the occupation? Recreation? Okay. Good. Anything else? Uh, I have a bunch of them. I have to read through them to take them out. Okay. We'll maybe come back if we have some time here. Did I give you a little bit of a script to explain the differences between the two? Okay, good. Thank you. Go ahead. You have a question? Okay. Let's go back here. Okay, my name's Savannah, and I really enjoyed what you said at the beginning of the class, list to last. Um, I used to be a buyer's agent for a little bit, so it totally is a whole different. When you start? Start, yes. Yes, working with sellers. Okay. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I'm Matt. And uh, it comes from the video, my little aha was uh, specializing in product and price reading area. Um, I wrote that down here too. Focus, yeah, focus, focus. 
yeah, on a price range. Um, I can tell you, because uh, and I wanted to mention this when I had heard that. You're, when you start, you're probably a little more comfortable with the first-time home buyers range, aren't you? Okay, it's kind of a natural place where you tend to. But I can tell you, try to advance yourself as, as quickly as possible. Um, I got into some clients, and it took me you know, quite a few years in the industry to get there. But when you start dealing in buyers and sellers that are in that half-million-dollar range, your paychecks change dramatically, okay? <laughs> and it's all of a sudden makes it fun. So yes, pick a price that you're comfortable with. And I had people, the once I kind of established myself in a price range, that if they got a client in that price range, they were referring them to me because they weren't comfortable and you need to get comfortable in that. But I can tell you, if you all of a sudden are out showing $750,000 homes, you're not comfortable in that. It's it's going to be tough. So, pick a price range that you work in, but always keep trying to work higher because average sales price goes higher, average commission goes higher, and you'll be much happier at the end of the month when you have more money in your account. Excellent. Thanks. I'm Brittany, um, and it was I liked your formula and kind of because when you're first starting out, it's hard to feel confident when you're like, oh, your house is only worth like in my opinion this much. Uh huh. So it was good to hear. That. They want to know this, but you're not going to do a net sheet for them. You're not going to know how much your title insurance is. You don't carry that. But they want to know this. And they need to know this if they're going out and buying it. So if you just know it, times the sales price. Well, yeah, if you sell, if we were to sell your house for, or when we sell your house, huh, Jessica, um, that if, when we sell it for 150 this is what you're going to net. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Trish Tullis. Um, I also liked your formula. Um, I also liked your options, one to 90 days, and when, especially when they're wanting to go up more, because it seems like that's what they want now. It is, isn't it? And having that good fallback on. It is. Good. It is. And you have to change it for the market. I tell you, I cautioned this when the market was doing this. I, this was just, but it I speak Japanese when I say dame because that's what they do in Japan, is that it's, that this land, this was this was the Dame price. Okay, all right. Claudia, my girlfriend. Okay, um, I think I like the, the part where I didn't realize, I guess, that the, just the personalities of all of our agents, and some of them may get a little bit ticked off or something so little that you just put, hey. <laughs> 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 so, so um, usually when I send a, an offer in, but not, you know, it just depends on the personality. Yeah. Um, I'll just say, hey, I just forward you, I'll, I'll call or I text. But if they do ask me, so what is it? Then I'll go, okay, so it's a full offer with sellers paying closing costs, da 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 da. Yeah. So they know. And because I have received it too, and um, I'm inspecting one thing, and then they add the, the closing, closing costs, they didn't tell you that. Yeah, and, and I'm already thinking, okay, so it's going to be this. And I'm like, God, I just think they didn't tell me it's going to put that on the counter or yeah. something like that. It told, she told me this. Yeah. And now they're adding something else that yeah. that was not what we talked about. So. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tamika Kuku. Um, basically, the CCs, because it does give you a good way of explaining to clients without going too far. You know, realistically, this is what we can do. This is why we can do it. You're not getting ninety thousand dollars for a house that's a mobile home, and no, it's yeah. just not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. Yep. So you can just literally sit there and be an accountant, uh -huh. show them that versus show them reality, basically. Uh, excellent. Okay. You already did it. You want to have any more? Yeah. You want to share? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I liked the six C's. That you talked about <clears throat> like with the whole curb appeal I never know what to tell you know sellers like what they should do or I feel uncomfortable uh -huh. um, but like I was reading here there's some very easy ideas like cutting the grass or buying a new welcome mat um, yep. so I think that's what yeah I and sometimes because um, sometimes I'm like 
you need to clean up your house. You know? yeah. And I don't know how to approach that. They need to clean it, but sometimes their furniture that is way outdated makes their house look more dated than it actually is. So sometimes just encouraging them, maybe you should go out and buy some new furniture. Guess what? You get to take that with you. Yeah. It's, it, you're not wasting that money. You're actually taking it. Now, take them more in the walls and put up some nice grade and it'll sell them. Yeah. Earth tone, they can't go wrong, but yes, grays, if it fits right, work. But they got to almost continue that theme throughout if they start it. So that's color. Okay. So what are the six C's without looking? Okay. Okay. Um, I got this. Okay. Color, condition, curb appeal, computer appeal, clutter, and um, um, cost. Cost. There you go. I'm just going to go up to <laughs> CMA. Cost, color, condition, clutter, curve appeal, computer appeal. Okay. Good. Uh, my name is Sheila, and mine was you actually cared about whether or not your client got a good night's sleep. You didn't want to freak them out with the numbers the night before. You'd rather talk to them in person so that they're not it is. emotionally stressed out over something. Man, and I've had them show up at my office and they go, Ugh, we just stressed about it. And they have a whole list of stuff that they stressed out about. Okay, and I can tell you, I can usually make a molehill out of what they've made it to be a mountain overnight. So yes, strategy-wise, give them the offer. In fact, I have a sheet right in my drawer that I pull out that I've created that just has offer, a line, and counter offer. And then I have the high points I've already made in my sheet that has like purchase price, seller concessions, earnest money, loan type, down payment, title company, inspections, and it's all listed on the site. So those are the points that I'm going to be hitting on the offer. I have that worksheet that I use with sellers. If you want it, come make a copy of it. I don't care, but that's what I use when I'm sitting down. So I don't even like them to go over the purchase agreement. I'm just hitting the high points of it. You just have a summary page that you go over with them and saying, this is this, this yes. is this, this is how this relates to this, and this is what it means. Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, my, uh, Stephen, and one of the things that I thought was awesome was when you were referring to your, your second appointment as this is going to be the most important meeting between now and closing. Yes. And that... It's awesome. It sets you up not only as the expert in that your meeting must be kept if they want to get their house sold. I mean, it's just, it, it does a lot in my mind. It does. It does. Excellent. Thank you. I like how you said you do the market analysis with the pending and the closed. Pending and closed? Yeah. Separate. And then also, huh? uh, love that video, how it talks about the Monday morning update and then the Friday market update. I tell you. If you're going to have multiple, multiple, multiple sellers because you want to list to last, right? Um, you need to set up time to communicate because I tell you, that's the biggest complaint that sellers generally have is that the agent doesn't communicate with them. So set it up in automatic feedbacks. Um, it's like $10 a month and stuff like that to do it automatic if you want to do that. So yes, that's automatic, but yes, you need to be making those phone calls. And I like that idea. I'm going to do that better too. Who wrote their cards? I know who I'm going to write it to. You know who you're going to write it to? Okay, get it done. I, I'm giving those to you, so please don't waste them and not use them. Please use them. Okay? Any other questions? Do you have an extra card? Yes, I do. Well, I don't know. I passed them, but they were on the back. Was there any? There's two cards left and one. Okay, I've got some. Just follow me up to my office. I'll grab you some. Okay. I just have them up in my cupboard. Yes. The numbers, as far as the boilerplate ones that I use, um, like the values, like bedrooms, bathrooms. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yes, because that if you get into doing the CMA in Navica, those are ones that are already set, and that's why I will not go out and buy another one of the softwares that does CMAs because they don't allow you have to go in and every CMA you have to go in and put those those generic numbers in every time and Navica keeps them in there on and I only do it on certain ones and it's bedrooms
bathrooms. I'm gonna just tell let me tell you right now because I only have certain ones in there. Bedrooms, twenty five hundred dollars per bathroom per bedroom. Bathrooms, thirty five hundred is what I use from zero for one to two bathrooms. Now, if it's one and a half a half bath, to my, in my opinion, I have that in there too. Half bath is a thousand dollars worth of value. I don't do anything different between a three quarter bath and a full bath. It's thirty five hundred to me. If I was to do it, I'd break it down at three thousand for a three quarter bath and thirty five hundred. But I try not to get that particular. I just do a full bath. I guess it. Age. I adjust a little bit different based off of how old it is. If it's newer than say two thousand, I'm adjusting five hundred dollars per year. If it's older than 2000, I use $100 a year. Um, square footage. Some people do pricing based off of their whole, just off of square footage. I use, and I've just come up with this because I'm adjusting for bedrooms and bathrooms, correct? So I'm not going to use, I mean, $100 a square foot. I'm using $10 a square foot. In my analysis, I'm adjusting for the square footage differences at $10 a square foot, but I'm, it's, it's a lot more than that when you count bedrooms and bathrooms and family rooms. Family rooms, $3,500 is what I use. Den is, a den is $2,000. Now, I'm venturing now into out of the ones that I use that are set automatically, and I'm using, I'm telling you some of my adjustments that I use when I'm doing the plus and minus game on them. And if you want to stop by my office, and I'll show you how I do right. how I do this. How you do like when they come out, the difference between yes or no, have one the updated or not updated kitchens, bathrooms, things like that. Um, that's when I adjust. They have a miscellaneous category okay. in the in the CMA, and that I'll do um, condition on there, and I'll adjust okay. there just in a like minus $10,000. If it's really dated and the new one's got granite countertops and everything, I'm taking into consideration in my condition category. Um, garages, it, zero to one, usually $5,000. If it's going from a one car garage to two car garage, so there is a garage going to two car, then I'll usually use 55, 5,000. If it goes from two car to three car, another $5,000, but I can tell you to buyers, it's worth a lot more than that. Certain price ranges. That's the third, yeah. third car garage. Toy box. 